Some of you may also know me as Dr. Whom, for those who hang out in the ISD podcast channel or the DerbyCon channel. And I'm also NW Houston on Twitter. Feel free to follow me. I'm here to tell you today about everything you've always wanted to know about academia, security academia, but we're too afraid to ask. And I hope you like Woody Allen movies. So, uh, I have to start with a disclaimer here. And this was because these opinions do not reflect my university, former employers, current employers, future employers, employers I don't even know about yet. And also, I'm in no way providing an answer to the life of the universe in everything. This is purely my opinion. I think it's a correct opinion. I think it's a valid opinion. But it's by no means the only correct and valid opinion on the topic. So please. If you get angry after the talk, don't beat me up. So I've got three goals that I want to cover during this talk. First goal will be I want to deal with some preconceived notions. And those preconceived notions will involve ones that industry has about academia and academia has about industry. I'd like to find some common ground so that we can figure out how industry and academia can work together on some pretty cool projects. And I want to provide enough of a foundation for a little bit of a Q&A at the end. So if folks in the audience have questions, I'll probably have a few questions from you. And we can have a bit of a discussion. So credentials, why am I up here talking about this? So I've spent the last five years as a PhD student studying informatic security. Just, it's digital security. Before that, so I've spent two years as a systems administrator in higher ed. My undergraduates uh, focus in network security. I've spent uh, about roughly uh, 24 weeks working for a nonprofit private R&D corp out west doing security related projects. And I feel that between these experiences, I've, I've experienced a bit of both sides of the fence. So what do I actually do, though, as a PhD student? Give you guys a little idea of what the PhD security student life is like. First, I do a lot of smartphone research. I've looked at some very general security limitations in smartphones in the paper Smartphone Security Traditions. I've looked at theoretical botnets. Basically, what do we have? Uh, to look, f what do we have to look forward to in regards to botnets based on the technology we're carrying around in our pockets right now, but the virus riders have been too lazy to produce up until this point. And also mobile malware epidemiology. What will future spreading dynamics of mobile malware look like or could look like? But that's really theoretical stuff. It, I, I mean, really, I haven't done anything there. I've just run a few simulations, I've talked a bunch. I haven't really produced anything. There's no real engineering in that. Oh, okay, that's fine. I've, I've got a kernel patch, I did that. I'm pretty proud. It took way longer than it should have. We're working on making some contributions to the Android open source project right now. We're, there's a lot of hoops to jump through there, it's, it's progress. And I try and do code dumps. Uh, most of my code that I've finished, completed, it should be up on GitHub. The address is right there. Hopefully someone will find some use for it. I like to, I like to provide uh, everything I do under open source licenses unless I'm warned not to do otherwise, which occasionally happens. So in general, what are we going to cover for the rest of class today? First, I want to tell you what academics do, uh, talk about some preconceived notions industry has about academia, try and combat those. That'll be part one. We're going to scale the ivory tower. Next, I want to talk about what academics think industry does. And finally, I want to try and give my idea of where the intersection between academia and industry lies and where they could come together to do something pretty awesome, or at least not step on each other's feet. So part one, let's scale the ivory tower, let's take a peek inside. And I want to do that by 
answering the first question that I hear far more than any other question about security academia. And that is this grand million dollar question of, well, are they behind industry? Uh, I, I will actually ask, what, what is the opinion of the audience on this, in fact? Uh, are they, what? Somebody shout out, do they think, what do you think? Is academia behind industry? Is industry behind academia? What's? Okay. Thank you. Excellent. You've looked at my talk before then, I think. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, that, uh, Okay, okay. Well, my, my opinion on this is I'm, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say a big resounding no. But I'm going to say that because I, I, I heard it from the front a little bit. I, I want to argue that academics are here to predict the future. As, as I heard in the back as well, it's a tangential question. They're trying to look ahead like the precogs from Minority Report. They may not always agree. They may not always be right but they're trying to both predict and shape what comes down the pipe 20 years down the road. So, what's some examples of this? They're looking at future threats. These are not by any means a complete set of examples, but a few that have stuck out in my mind that I found interesting. Uh, the first being a paper that came out in about 2006 from Penn State University on exploiting cell phone networks. What Patrick Trainer, his advisor, and the other students did was look at the load databases tape that are running at these home location registers, basically cell stations that have to keep track of all the people on this local cell network. How long those databases take to pro process certain SMS requests. And they found that certain SMS requests that are part of the standard, but not normally used by anybody, take a really long time. So what happens when you have 1,000, 2,000 phones all sending these requests to numbers in this geographic area? You just killed the cell network. This was done back in 2006, before pretty much right before there was the big smartphone boom. Now everybody's having smartphones. We've got malware on smartphones. How easy would it be for some malware to now perform this functionality? There's the vehicle hacking paper done by the University of Washington folks. And for those who might not have known this, return-operated programming, or return-oriented programming, sorry, return-oriented programming, the exploit technique, came out of a paper from academia. And that's used all the time now. And finally, I, I am going to be completely biased here uh, and talk a little bit more about my work on mobile botnets to give a little bit more detail on why I think that is predicting the future. So if those in the audience are Batman fans or not Batman fans, but still remember the movie, uh, the second new one by Chris Nolan, at one point towards the end of the movie, uh, I, I will avoid any detailed spoilers for those who haven't seen it, but Ma Batman gives Lu Lucius Fox control of this computer that is using cell phones throughout Gotham City to track people in the city via sonar. They're able to record things on the, on the microphone of the phone and try and map out where everybody is in the city. Well, what we did was kind of like that, but not nearly the Hollywood version. So, I need you to use your imaginations for a second. Picture yourself as a green dot walking around the city of Chicago. You've got a smartphone. Everybody around you has a smartphone. Throughout that city, there's these red dots. These red dots belong to a botnet. This botnet has modified the smartphones it's running on to enable monitor mode. What monitor mode allows you to do, for those who don't know, you can promiscuously sniff every wireless packet, even if you're not associated with a network. What that means is you're even sniffing wireless probe frames. And these are frames that if your Wi-Fi is on, even if you're not connected to a network, your phone is sending out every few seconds. And those have unique identifiers. 
So what does this mobile tracking botnet do? Well, it just records when it sees your MAC address. The bot will record its GPS position. And you've got that timestamp. You send it up to the command and control server. The botnet master waits a day and then plots all the sightings of you on Google Earth. And suddenly they now were able to track you throughout the city. Now, the requirements for the existence of this, we were looking at it back in, started in 2008. Well, you A, need a botnet. So we had to use simulation to look at this because ethically it's hard to convince your internal review board that you should be able to create a botnet to perform your research. You also needed monitor mode for smartphone Wi-Fi. And we were looking at Android devices. And up until two weeks ago, when Dave Kennedy, I saw Dave Kennedy post this on Twitter, Android devices didn't have monitor mode. Now somebody hacked the firmware. We've got monitor mode. And finally, you'll, need a, you'll either need to collect MAC addresses. You can either collect them along the way, or you have a specific target you're looking for. But back in 2008, even the malware authors weren't even considering this. Now at least it's a technical, it's technically feasible. We just haven't seen it yet. But it's quite possible something like this could exist. Now, the actual analysis of this without creating it was pretty simple. This is the sort of thing we do in academia all the time. We might not be able to do some engineering, but we can try and simulate what we want to look at. And that really just required a machine with a bunch of cores to run the Python simulations, because I'm a horrible Python programmer. A GIS map of the area that we want to analyze. Some population data about the area, because, I mean, if we're going to simulate this because we can't put the phones out there, we might as well actually have an accurate number of people. Otherwise, it's meaningless. And finally, a PhD student like myself was a bunch of time to write the code. All of these are all in all, pretty cheap. But they also deal with future defenses. Uh, future threats are not the only thing that security academia is interested in. Now here, my, my favorite area to mention is cryptography because I always think they're this awesome example of something, of an area that comes up with this new functionality for security and privacy, but they do it 30 or 40 years before we have computers that can actually run what they came up with. And a great example of this is RSA. I mean, this, I, I think this is what we use every day when we're accessing Internet sites securely. Well, the algorithm that was based on came out in 78. There were a bunch of systems people in the talk where the authors were presenting this paper that said, oh, no, that's never going to happen. I mean, we can't even run that. That the, requires so much power. Uh, 30 years later, we now run it on everything, everywhere. I think the next big thing in this area is fully homomorphic encryption. That's a fancy term for, I can encrypt all my data on my computer, I can upload it to the cloud, Google or whoever owns the cloud can do all the processing on it, and then they don't even unencrypt it when they're doing this processing. They'll run the simulation on the encrypted code without even knowing what that data is, and then I can download it again, I unencrypt it, and I've got my answer. In academia, the burden of proof is also a little bit different than industry. So think to the other talks you've seen at DerbyCon. What, what do we look for when somebody talks about an attack? They give you a proof of concept. They say, hey, look, I just popped this box. Bam, it works. When you're writing an academic paper, many times I'd like to think that should be enough because in memory, many areas of research, that's especially attack research, that's really... I mean, if you're doing attack research on systems, that's a solid metric. I mean, if it works, it works. In places, it's a zero-sum game. It either works or it doesn't work. But in other papers, you have to provide a lot of evidence of, okay, it works, it works this well, it'll work for this long, and you give a whole bunch of statistics. And so an easy way to remember that is in a lot of exploit research, it's really just preponderance of the evidence. This idea that as long as you show that it works, it's fine. In academia, many times you're working under beyond a reasonable doubt. You have to convince everybody but that there's no possible way 
that this would ever work, except in extremely rare, very rare circumstances. We're not always looking at current products. A lot of that's because, well, we don't have a lot of money. And this is both a blessing and a curse. So think back, if we're trying to predict the future, if we don't have to worry about current products, that's awesome because we're not going to be limited by what uses the current products are currently being used for and their limitations. We can sort of think beyond that. The problem with that is, well, now in some cases we're having to ignore whole areas of research. I can't think of one university that I've seen that's done really awesome skater research. I don't know, and I'm sure there's academics out there who are looking at this, but I have not met them. And I really want academia to work on that because it's an area that I think we could have some really cool inventions. And it's an area where, uh, well, they've just sort of discovered security. So good luck to our power grids. And like a general practitioner examining a sheep, we don't always know the best practices in academia. I mean, we're not going to be sys, we're not pen testers, we're not security pluses, we're not sys admins most of the time. And that's a, both a benefit and a curse. I think there is a certain foundational knowledge area that one gains having those certifications. I don't think the certifications are the only way in which to gain that foundational knowledge. And some academics, usually through undergraduate courses, should be gaining this information. Of course, that debate is for a whole nother talk at a whole nother derby con. But the benefit is we're now not beholden to what the best practices are. We can think beyond them and try and really focus on the technology because best practices change and they change with the technology. What's a best practice now might be completely stupid 10, 15 years down the line. And so if we're using those to cloud our ideas of research, what we produce might not be that useful. We're also slaves to deadlines. So think of all the call for papers that, or call for presentations that hacker cons have each year. And that happens all the time in academia too, with academic content. And I'm sure everyone's heard the cliche, publish or perish. And while it's a cliche, it's completely true. I mean, literally, your academic career, being able to find a job after five years as a PhD student is about the sheer number of publications you have. And you need a large number of them now if you want to get an academic job right off the bat that's not a postdoc. And that creates a situation where academics are always in a rush. They're always running from conference to conference to conference. Think about this. So we've got what? DEF CON, DERBY CON, HACKER CON, SKYDOG CON, uh, SHMOO CON, B-SIDES all over the place, THOUGHT CON. Now picture this. Your career depended on you coming up with a new idea for each of these conferences and submitting a CFP to each of these conferences every single year. That's what happens in academia. You have all these venues, and you want to target every single one with a new paper and a new idea to get your name out there to bolster that publication list because it's publish or perish. And of course, being always in a rush has some side effects. And these are perhaps some that folks in industry see a lot when they use code or products produced by academia. It's kind of like this teapot. It's not very functional. It's, you know, you're going to tip it over, lid's going to come off. And the academic code equivalent of that is comments? What comments? Documentation? Oh, just read the paper. Oh, you want my code? Uh, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. It always will be forever and ever. Uh, that's actually why I like to put my code up on GitHub. We also have an internal firewall GitHub where a lot of the stuff I can't publish 
or I don't, I'm not happy with yet to let the world see, I publish on our internal GitHub. But then at least all the other CS students see it, and I can shame them into commenting their code more because they'll see how commented my code is. <clears throat> now, I want to end part one by talking about what you shouldn't expect academics to do. First off is pen tests. I think academics should be aware of pen tests, but the only time I'd feel confident, confident watching an academic do a pen test is if they're working with the local government on e-voting stuff. I know a couple folks out in the University of California system that do just that, and they do some pretty awesome work, but send them to a large corporation, set them down with a Metasploit box, good luck. Threat analysis. The only time they're going to do threat analysis is on the systems they produce. You ever read an academic systems paper that's in security? They'll have a whole chunk of a threat analysis on, well, here's my def defense mechanism. Here's how I expect attackers to attack it. Don't send them to a company. Have them write up this wonderful threat analysis and a risk report for a company like Microsoft. It just ain't going to happen. And implementation. I sort of cover that on the usable slide. But the best you're going to get is a high fidelity prototype. And that's okay. If you're in R&D, you're happy when it just works, let alone having a pretty product that works really well. And some of that, uh, the discussion of implementation, I want to get back to a little bit in part three. But to be fair, while one should not necessarily expect an academic to do these or have a very strong foundation in these because in the end they're not, it's not really their job. They're in R&D. They should be at least aware of the basic concepts and who to talk to. So, part two, what academics think industry does. I want to preface this by saying these are not my views on what I think industry does. I love all of you. I think you're all awesome. But I don't know if you've had conversations with academics. They're getting a little snotty with you. Maybe they think you don't know what you're talking about, even though you've been doing it for years and years and years and years. And this will help you maybe understand why they are having this work perception of what you're doing. And so perhaps you can confront them a little differently, or at least you'll feel better knowing that, well, at least now I understand why. Academics think industry just does vulnerability analysis. All I'm going to do is take a look at the new software and then sell my next bug bounty to Google Chrome. Pardon? Or the NSA. I, I, I bet they don't pay quite as well as Google. Virus pattern analysis. Well, I'm just that guy who's sitting at F-Secure or Kaspersky, and every time one of those reports comes in, I write my little signature to put in the AV so that I can sell it in our enterprise product because we know that AV stops viruses all the time, right? It's awesome. Or my favorite, you know, they just, they just break stuff. They go on a rampage. They're hired by a company, they go in and they just break stuff. All they're doing is telling a company, well, I was able to do this and it broke, fix it. Or maybe they're just programming stuff, they're just writing Ruby, they're working for a company, they're just being code monkeys. The overall impression that I've gotten talking to other people in my field is that they think folks in industry don't do anything interesting. I don't even understand how that concept even came about because maybe maybe it's because they, they a lot of them don't come to DerbyCon and see the other talks and see the awesome stuff that is going on in the next few rooms. But that, I think, is what it somewhat came down to. Oh. 
And at least in this case, knowing is half the battle. So finally, part three, where the intersection between academia and industry is. So first, to be able to figure out where this intersection is, we need to define boundaries. Because for those who own houses here, fences make good neighbors. So I think the equation for those boundaries looks something like this. I've tried to argue earlier in the talk that academics need to look at the future. They're there to do R&D. They're not really forced to look at specific products. They can usually work on whatever they want. They've got a freedom from quarterly profits, and what they produce is never really expected to work, but when it does, everybody's happy. They're not really beholden to clients and a service level agreement. Industry can look at the now. So, they've got ties with vendors. They've got, they've got ties with the companies they're contracting to perform a pen test for, find vulnerabilities with. And they've got, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'd assume there there is some influence over the product that is produced. Maybe not a whole bunch, but you can at least nudge the rock up the hill a little bit. And at least have industry connections to get vulnerabilities fixed. It's not like in an academic paper where I'm seeing a, somebody publishes it and there's a list of vulnerabilities in this paper and the whole paper was written around this idea of finding vulnerabilities which all they proved was developers don't follow security coding guidelines. Surprise? Did we not know this already? You've just found all these vulnerabilities and you've, you've sort of wasted it. If somebody out in industry did this, they'd be like, I know a guy at Google, I'll just pass this off to him, it'll get taken care of. Or in this case, I know somebody at Samsung or HTC, if they're working in the mobile industry, they can get this stuff fixed. So industry can look at the now. Academics are looking at the future. So what, do the, what, so what does this mean? What does the picture look like then? So you add those two up, what we get is together they look at the soon. The idea is we'll have academics teamed up with industry people. The academics can use their skill sets that are really focused on looking 20 years down the road on what things might look like. Industry people know what's realistic, what's going on right now. So what can happen, maybe the... Maybe the feedback looks something like the academic can say, well, why, why don't we try this crazy idea number one? The industry guy says, no, that could kind of work. But the problem is when we actually put this stuff in the field, it just doesn't make any sense. It might work in the lab, but it's never going to work when we've got the racks installed in some data center somewhere. I think an awesome field where this sort of partnership would work really well is, again, I'm going to go back to SCADA. Industry people have the capital to be able to pick up the SCADA equipment. Academics have that skill set to perform some interesting down the road research ideas. And so you can get that feedback loop of academics finding interesting new ways that the SCADA systems can work together. The industry folks know exactly how they can either sell that to their management or help direct that inquiry into areas that will be the most use to people out in the field. And then eventually something beautiful can come from that. So what that means in the end is what I'd really like to see is some cross-pollination. I want to see some industry people and some academics working together under one umbrella. I think a great example of that would be AT&T Bell Labs from back in the day. And I think we've got Microsoft Research sort of does it now a little bit. The company I work for, SRI, kind of does that. But Bell Labs, man. You go to a place, you've got all these PhDs, you've got these engineers working under the same roof. You can't walk down the hall without meeting somebody coming up with a crazy idea. Then the office next door, the engineer pokes his head out and says, 
Wait, I think I think we can build that. I mean, they were they were basically a prophetized uh, a prophetized hacker space with what they came up with, and I think that's what we really need in the end. At least a few of these places where we can get the infosec industry community together with the academics that are out there and start working on products so that five and ten years down the way we've made a very strong impact on the foundations of infosec. So maybe we won't have to fight quite as many fires. Or at least maybe fighting those fires will now be easier. Maybe that'll never go away. So I want to thank you all for coming here, being an audience. I want to thank DerbyCon and open the floor to questions, comments. Let's have a bit of a discussion. Oh yeah, I've I, I've heard that. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't know. I I can't. I'm not exactly aware of the history, the exact history of this. I will give my I can give my two cents on the topic. So, the RSA algorithm is really just one specific implementation of these basic mathematical concepts of prime numbers. Uh, I've heard um, and I've heard this story before and it's it's extremely feasible because really all they're doing is they're uh, they were what they do in uh, cryptographic research when they're working on these algorithms is they first try and find some they go back to basic computational theory and they're looking for problems which are NP hard or on average NP hard. So they're problems that we just can't quickly compute. Basic, theoretically, doesn't matter what we do, we just can't easily compute. And one of those problems involves large prime numbers and algorithms. It's uh, the, uh, let's see, the discrete logarithm problem, I think. It's been a while since I've done crypto work. And so, of course, factoring the algorithm or logarithm is very, very difficult, especially when you have very prime numbers. So my guess is what happened is the guy uh, across the pond was putzing with the same basic fundamental problems, has a construct that's slightly different, but yeah, he was under, uh, basically uh, had to do, he was doing top secret research, so the British military never really wanted him to publish any of that. And we've had a number of, I mean, the RSA is one example, and we've had a number of other uh, algorithms that are very similar since then as well. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think there, there's, well, to be perfectly honest, while my, my, my advisor's a cryptographer, he does some awesome work, I've also met a large number of awesome cryptographers who are working at IBM and Intel and a number of these private companies. And I'm sure the NSA is always looking for cryptographers. Uh, yeah, no, I would agree with that. I'd agree with that. I, I would, I think I, I would offer a caveat employee there a little bit that the people they probably hired were PhDs. Um, or, or the mathematicians, yeah. Uh, but, I think part of that too is it's a funding, it's also a funding issue. And in terms of the academic world, when you're a faculty member, what suddenly happens is you 
can no longer get your hands dirty. You're just managing a bunch of grad students who are doing all the work. And the time you have to sit down and write a few lines of C code is minimal. Which I think they kind of hate, but it's just part of the job description. Oh, yeah. 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 And they never, yeah. Well, and, and of course now we're having this huge lag behind companies are still, all they're doing is just running a SHA-1 hash and even using a seed, but we've got GPUs now. It, just a basic hash and a seed doesn't help when you can run hashcat on your GPU and blow through 600,000 passwords in a few hours. Um, the hashing algorithms themselves, we need to start. We're looking at the wrong criteria, I think, right now. Even sh It'll be interesting with SHA-3, because I've actually, uh, I've implemented one of the candidates for SHA-3 on a GPU, and it was faster than the implementation for SHA-1 on this computer. Yeah, so at least some of the algorithms were running faster on a GPU than the older, uh, than the older SHA algorithms, which means we're not, maybe we're making them faster for CPUs, but, or, or we're trying to make it a little bit more secure on CPUs, but on GPUs, Nobody seems to be now looking at some of the academic research that I'm sure out there figuring out, well, we need to figure out some hashes that will run fast enough for our purposes, but slow enough on GPUs that we can't blow through them. Yeah, well, and I, I think uh, Blizzard did. Blizzard actually, with their passwords, used uh, something that. Yes, exactly. So, and that's one company out of how many out there that are storing passwords right now. Well, okay, this is, this is a good question. I'm gonna answer it to the best of my ability. Uh, first thing, I think more academics need to come to your side. There's probably like three of us, maybe, maybe a handful. Now there's people who work in academia. I, I'm just meaning the, 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 the people who are gonna eventually get a job and try and convince faculty somewhere what's gonna be cool. Um, Uh, I think, I think more academics need to come here. And I am also, I am actually, as a former sysadmin at a higher education university, I do appreciate all the sysadmins at higher education universities that show up.
So, so I can just send my the social security numbers to the right, through my Hotmail account. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Plain text. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, that's certainly an issue. Uh, but I think, I think getting those academics here to hear what's going on in industry and what industry folks are dealing with right now, I think will help. Just because it's going to build network. Uh, I mean, hallway track. So, eventually, if you beat a dead horse long enough, sure, it's not going to come back alive, but you will move it a few inches. Uh, but I, I want to, before I answer, I want to, I want to continue a little bit more with this question of, of what can they, they can do because I, I've, I've got a couple more points on it. Uh, the the other one. Besides just cross-pollination, I think industry needs to be more accepting that research is not going to make money. Uh, not all R&D. R&D is not a profitable exercise, but it is still valuable because you can use it as PR. You could say, look at the cool stuff we're doing. Um, I think a great example of that is for those who read F-Secure's blog. They do an awesome balance between showing what research they're currently working on, providing information, while and not being extremely blatant about marketing their products. Every once in a while they'll slip something in, but there's certain, I will certainly say there's another AV company that does some podcasts and blogs, and it feels like it's 90% marketing, 10% information. That's my personal opinion. Um, so I think... I think those two things could go a long way. And, and just general, this intermingling uh, in the social context so that the two sides appreciate each other a little bit more in what they're doing and come up with a few interesting, crazy ideas. Uh, a couple questions were over here. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I would say yes and no. Um, yes in the sense there's a lot of grants out there. And we can even apply for the cyber fast track stuff. So, you know, the uh, for those who don't know, the pen test framework that George is talking about came from the cyber fast, fast track grant. It's really cool stuff. And that's not, and that's can be uh, applied for. I, I'm pretty sure that can be applied for by uh, gra uh, actual graduate students or, or current PhD students and whatnot. Uh, there's also there's a lot of DHS funding, DOD funding, DARPA, a little bit of it. NSF is coming around to cybersecurity stuff. I don't think they're necessarily primary grant funders, uh, but the the no side of this is uh, it's hard to get these as a PhD student. You have you have to get your name on there with a faculty member. And some of these grants, it's about who you know. So if you know the right people, it'll be much easier getting these applications accepted, getting the money in. But the money is definitely out there. Uh, and my guess is it's only going to and there, I mean, the government, U.S. government, is extremely worried about. Uh, I, I won't. I'm not going to use the dirty C word, but threats that come from online. Um, yeah, that's same. I lump all those together. Fellowship is just a grant with 
more words or with letters on it. Expect results though. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is actually something I've heard I've heard mixed opinions about. I've got some friends who are PhD students in Canada and they're saying overall the finding uh, lab positions, R and D positions is a bit harder up there. But they yeah. But then and, and so their their idea was, well, we're gonna go graduate eh, and start a startup, which these two guys were dang smart guys, so I figured if anybody could do it they could. But that was that to me was a very interesting mentality because most of the PhD students I talk to here don't say, well, I'm going to go get my PhD and do a startup. They're saying, I'm going to get my PhD and find a cushy tenure track position where I can just sit down and work and not have to worry about anything and get a paycheck. I mean, so this is this is a hard. I will preface this by saying this is a hard thing to do, and it's a hard thing to do that for those of us who are even academics. But keep up on on what the current research is. I think that, in, and in that regard, the thing is, pay attention to what's coming out at the hacker cons, and also pay attention to what's coming out at some of the bigger security conferences. So, so ACM, IEEE, both those organizations will have a big one. IEEE's is called Security and Privacy. ACM's is called Computers and Communication Security, I think is what it, the acronym is CCS, but I never remember what it stands for. And then my personal favorite is Usenix Security. And they've got an awesome, and they're pretty good about actually, uh, if you want another conference to go to, if you want to in, intermingle with a lot of academics, is any of the Usenix conferences. The Usenix Security is primarily security. Their large installation systems administrators conference usually has a security track, but there's usually a group of academics there and still enough and a large number of industry people. And I've at the I've yet to see a, a fight break out, so I think they, they get along relatively well. Um, but yeah, keep up on the research. Um, try and find time where you can just toy around with stuff you like. I mean, in the end. Yeah, and actually, one thing I do is, while well, it's not my field, uh, the the journal's nature and the journal's science has free podcasts, and I like listening to those just because research method methodology is done far far better in other disciplines than mine. That's off. The, that's also a, to a topic for a whole other talk. So I like to listen to these podcasts to see how other disciplines, research disciplines, are doing things and figure out, well, can I apply those back to InfoSec? And sometimes that you'll get, you can get a really awesome idea.
Well, I think we're about done. I want to thank you all. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for having this talk. I hope I hope it was worthwhile to y'all. And I like hearing your thoughts on things during this. And I, I hope the uh, cherry juice was... Thanks. Thanks.